All right. Yeah. Uh, so there are two classes of methods to do that, direct methods, which are uh, very robust, very accurate. Uh, they work basically as a black box, but they are also very expensive uh, because they rely on, on factorizing the matrix. And then we have iterative methods, which are much cheaper. Uh, if we look at the one iteration, but the, the issue is that their convergence and therefore the, the total number of iterations is, is quite application dependent. Uh, the way I, I like to summarize this, this state of things is that direct methods, uh, to make them effective, we need fast factorizations, whereas iterative methods, we need good preconditioners. And in this talk, I'm essentially going to try to tackle both issues within the same framework by working on approximate factorizations, which we'll be able to use either as uh, fast approximate direct methods or as hopefully high quality preconditioners for iterative methods. I'm mainly going to focus on two types of approximations. The first is dropping. So basically just replacing with zero any sufficiently small uh, value. So if we have a, a sparse matrix, uh, we can decide the threshold epsilon and any, any coefficient that is smaller than this epsilon, we're just going to drop it. So the, the matrix will be sparser. Um, but perhaps this is not the most common way of using dropping. Um, we generally look at the LU factors of this matrix, and then uh, we apply a similar kind of strategy to uh, make those LU factors um, sparser. So that's what we call an incomplete LU factorization. Um, so that's the first approximation. The other approximation is uh, low rank compression. Uh, if we see dropping as sparsification, this is basically data sparsification in the sense that the, the Matrix now is, is not necessarily sparse, it can be dense, but there's still a lot of uh, data uh, that we can drop. Uh, so basically, if we look at the singular value decomposition of the matrix, and we again have a, a threshold epsilon, we know that we can truncate a lot of those singular vectors that are associated with small singular values and still get something that is quite accurate. Uh, in the applications I'm going to consider, which is the solution of linear systems, that the matrix A is usually not uh, you know, low rank, but it, it has often for many applications, a, a block low rank structure. So if we look at off diagonal blocks of the matrix, those are indeed uh, low rank. Uh, for those who know hierarchical matrices, this is basically the same idea. Um, but I'm going to focus on, on the simpler BLR here. So those are the two types of approximations I, I want to talk about. Uh, and mainly what, what I want to, to say here is that they have a common point, which I think is, is a common weakness, which is that they only deal in absolutes. What I mean by that is that we have this threshold epsilon, right, that I mentioned, and this threshold controls the approximation. It says either we drop what is smaller than epsilon or whatever is higher than epsilon, we keep it at full accuracy. And there's no middle ground. And so I, I think that's not a strategy that is very uh, timely or in the spirit of, of, of today, uh, mainly due to the evolution of the floating point landscape. So nowadays we have, as you can see in this table, many different types of, of floating point precisions. And especially uh, we have an emergence of lower precisions. Uh, so namely half and even quarter precisions, so 16 bit or eight bit formats. And these, of course, are uh, very fast, very efficient uh, on modern hardware, but they're also not so accurate, obviously. So, um, so the idea that I'm going to propose is, is essentially a new, a new paradigm that uh, tries to use is um, not just one level of approximation, this epsilon, but multiple levels in maybe almost a gradual kind of uh, approach. So how are we going to, to use these, these precisions? We're, we're going to do something called mixed precision algorithms. There's actually many different ways of mixing precision together. Uh, Nick Haim and Nick uh, and I have a survey that try and describe and classify different ways of, of doing that. So if you're interested, you, you can check it out. Uh, in, in this presentation, I, I'm going to focus on, on a particular subclass uh, that we have called adaptive precision. So we have a section on, on that type of approach which is fairly recent actually, uh, listed here a number of papers that I think uh, enter this, this framework and you can see that they're all in the last couple of years. So that's, that's what we're going to use. So first, let me try and define what adaptive precision means. So the idea is that 
we have an algorithm, we have this prescribed target epsilon. And what we ask is what is the minimal precision that we need for each instruction in our algorithm? So the first question is why are we expecting the precisions to vary from one instruction to another? Why shouldn't we just set the precision to epsilon or whatever is the closest precision that we have to epsilon? And that's it, right? So the, the, the reason is that not all computations inside the algorithm are equally important. And to, to illustrate this, let me take a very simple example, the sum of, of two floating point numbers, A and B, where B is much smaller uh, than A, then as you can see from the picture, the, the least significant bits of B are actually not going to matter much. They're basically not going to affect uh, the, the precision of the, the result. And therefore, that means that these bits are not needed, so we could just store B in lower precision. And if B is the result of a previous computation, we could have performed that computation in, in low precision. So that's, that's the idea. And so adaptive precision algorithms try to uh, leverage this observation by adapting the precision to the data at hand, um, basically by switching the less important data to lower precision. Well, less important is application dependent, but it usually means smaller uh, in some sense. So I want to give you two examples of how we can specialize this adaptive precision idea in different contexts. Uh, and the, the first example is uh, SPMVs, sparse matrix vector products. So this is joint work with, with colleagues from Sorbonne, including Fabienne, who is just here. And um, here, so the goal is to compute a sparse matrix vector product um, with an accuracy of epsilon, but using Q different precisions, U1, U2, up to UQ. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the elements of the matrix across these uh, different precisions. So how are we going to do that? We're going to place each element in a different bucket. So we have Q buckets one bucket for each precision. And then we'll sum elements that are in bucket number K in the corresponding precision number K. So of course, the big question is, which element do we need to put in which bucket? And we have an error analysis that answers this question uh, and basically comes up with the construction here, which is illustrated uh, just in the figure. So we have the, the real line, right? We're going to look at the absolute value of the elements. We're going to map them to the, the real line. So we'll have two, two extreme cases. The um, very small elements will be dropped, just like I, I talked at the beginning. The largest elements will be kept in the, in the full precision, in the highest precision we have. But in the middle, that's the new part, we're going to gradually lower the precision as the elements get smaller and smaller. Okay, so we're going to adapt the precision to the magnitude of the other. And we have an analysis that basically proves that if we, if we do this, um, the computed result satisfies the, the accuracy that we want. So now the question is, is that going to give us something interesting in practice? Do we have matrices where the elements vary in such a way that we actually can store many elements in low precision? That's completely matrix dependent. If you take a binary matrix or a bohemian matrix, I think probably there's nothing to do because all elements are, are very, very similar. But in, in some applications, of course, we have great variations in magnitude. And so those are the, the applications I, I want to look at. So here I, I've taken um, 34 matrices from, from Swiss bars, and I'm plotting the uh, gains that we have with respect to a uniform precision approach, so the approach that just stores everything at the same precision. So this is given as a percentage of the uniform cost, so lower, lower is better. And so you can see that the, there's a significant number of matrices where we have a very, very important reduction in, in storage. Um, but this is just the storage reduction. Now, can we leverage the theoretical reduction into, into times? So we implemented this uh, using uh, just two precisions, uh, so single and double precision. And, um, and yes, we, we do get something out of it, uh, it's not, as good as the theory, as the theoretical gain, but we still get some significant speed ups on, on, a, on a range of matrices. Um, so the idea now is to, is to basically plug this adaptive precision SPMV within an iterative solver and, and hopefully that will accelerate things. Um, so, so that's uh, what we're going to try to do. For this, we're going to use uh, GM REST based iterative refinement. Doesn't have to be that, it could be any iterative solver, any anything really, 
Um, but the nice uh, thing about this uh, framework is that we're going to be able to use actually lower lower precision. So how, how does that work? We have uh, on the right, uh, the iterative refinement, classic iterative refinement approach, uh, where at each outer iteration, we need to solve uh, an inner uh, correction system. And how do we do this? We do this by using jammers. Okay, so this was, um, this has been the object of much recent work. Uh, and here we are basically interested in the performance of the, of the SPMVs that happen in this algorithm. So there are two of them, the one in the inner iterations in, in GMRS and the one in the outer iterations, which is to compute the residual. And so without entering too much in, into the details, um, in general, the, there are some, some conditions under which we know that we can run the GMRS, the inner solver in low precision and still converge to high precision. So what that, does that mean? So it means that in our context, we're going to have two different epsilon targets. The outer SPMV, which is called just a few times, we'll just do that in, in high accuracy. So the inner SPMV in the, in the inner generous, we're going to do this with a very low uh, target, but still in adaptive precision. And so here is just an example. Um, uh, so I, I've just taken this matrix as an illustrative you know, purpose. Um, I don't have like a full range of results yet. This is ongoing work. Uh, but basically, I just want to, to use this matrix, um, which is fairly simple uh, to, to illustrate what, what is the effect of using adaptive precision. So here I'm comparing two uniform precision algorithms. In, in blue, we have a P32. In, in red, we have BFLOW 16. So as you can see, unfortunately, and notice that we converge here to double precision accuracy. So this illustrates the fact that with single precision, we can still reach double precision. With BFLOW 16, we, we can't. It's, it doesn't work here. And uh, if we just reason uh, on the cost of this algorithm, obviously, the, the, I'm going to say FP32 is just one. I'm going to normalize by that. By that. So the, the BFLOW 16 would be 0 0.5. This is the cost per iteration, so it doesn't converge. Um, and now in, in yellow, you can see the adaptive, um, our adaptive algorithm with a target that is basically equivalent to FP32. So as expected, the yellow curve matches the, the blue one, but the cost is lower because we are making use of lower precisions, right? So it's 0.88, 12% gains. Not huge, but it's just to, to have a nice illustration. There are matrices where the, the gains are higher. Uh, and what is really nice about this is that this epsilon is not a precision, right? It's not an actual, it's not constrained by the, the arithmetics that I have on my hardware. It's just a mathematical par parameter. So I can you know, try other values for this epsilon while still using only supported floating point arithmetics and that, and that works. So that's a, the beauty of this approach. In particular, I can get as low as uh, two to the power minus 18 and still converge reasonably fast. And now the, the, the gain that I have is, is, is higher. Okay, so as I mentioned, this, this type of element-wise uh, approaches is um, rather used, maybe not on the original sparse matrix A, but on, on rather preconditioners, mainly because if I go back here, you can notice that the number of iterations is quite huge. This is because I've, I've used just a very simple preconditioner. I know in practice, we, we want to use a, a better preconditioner. So that's, that's the future maybe of this approach would be to generalize this adaptive precision to, to not only SPMVs, but preconditioners. So uh, let me just say a few words about doing this for ILU. So basically the, the math part is, is the same. We have this um, uh, construction, this bucket construction. We're, we're going to drop the very smallest elements, but then the intermediate ones, we're not going to drop them. We're just going to switch them to lower precision, but the, the idea is the same. And again, we can prove that by doing this, we, we get a, an accuracy, a backward error of uh, whatever we want. We can control it with this parameter. Uh, so just an example again to, to, to illustrate. Um, so here I have a matrix. Um, this is the uh, incomplete LU factors for, for relatively small epsilon. So this gives me actually a very good preconditioner. Preconditioned matrix is, you know, is very well conditioned. On the middle, I have the adaptive version of this ILU where I'm matching the same level of accuracy. So it's as good a preconditioner, but the storage is divided by almost a factor of two. Okay. So, okay, nice. I think another way of looking at this, which is perhaps even, even nicer, is to ask the question, what if, I, what if I force the ILU 
to match my storage budget. What do I get done? So this is the answer. So here I have to increase epsilon to match the same storage. But then what I get out of that is a very bad precondition. Right? I've lost um, the, the quality. And so before I, I get any questions, um, we have not implemented this on a, on a real hardware. Um, it seems challenging, I'm aware of it. So yeah, it's part of future work. And yeah, and so that brings me to the second example. Again, we're still in the same framework, adaptive precision, but now we're not going to use this on, on sparse SPMV matrices, but on, on low rank approximations. So uh, this is a, a different piece of work, uh, also a joint work with uh, colleagues across France. And um, so here we have a, a low rank approximation of a matrix, let's call it B, uh, because it's a block in, in my matrix A that I, that I want to solve the linear system. And I'm not happy with this uh, approximation because the rank here is actually quite big. Right? So what, what can I do to increase the compression rate? The standard approach would be to just increase upside, discard more vectors, I get a, you know, a more compact approximation, but it's also much less accurate. So the adaptive precision approach is different. We're going to keep all these vectors. We're going to be as accurate as before, but we're going to switch those that we can to lower precision. So how do, do we do that? We, we partition the, the singular vectors into groups. And then those that are associated with sufficiently small singular values, we're going to switch them to lower precision. And again, that's the, the intuitive um, idea, but why does it work? We have an error analysis to, to, to explain why. So basically the reason is you can see this SVD as the sum of, of different low rank components, so B1, B2, B3 associated with these different uh, singular values. And the coefficients of these terms basically decrease or are proportional to the associated singular values. It's not very hard to see. Therefore, what we're doing is really summing coefficients that become smaller and smaller. So it's basically exactly the same thing as I presented for the SPMV. We can switch the smaller coefficients to lower precision. Okay, so that's the kind of informal explanation. And then we have a formal analysis that gives us explicit criterions on the singular values, uh, after which we know that it's safe to switch from one precision to another. And uh, so again, just I like to illustrate things with just one matrix, then we have results on, on many matrices, but here I'm going to show results on this matrix here, uh, which comes from our uh, partners from EDF. So here I'm, I'm showing the normalized storage. Uh, so again, I, I recall that I'm not doing a low rank approximation of my matrix, I'm doing it by blocks. So it's a blockwise low rank approximation. And the, the darkness, the color here of the block is proportional to the rank. So as you can see, off diagonal blocks are, are much more low rank. And, and here it's the uniform precision standard approach where I have everything in the same precision. Uh, but this is what I get when I switch to uh, lower precision. So here I have a much reduced storage by a factor of about two, because I can actually switch um, half of my entries to single precision and a third of my entries to B float 60. So that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, and so I, I just want to give a few examples of what happens on, on different blocks. Uh, so for example, this is a diagonal block of the matrix. Obviously it's full rank. So here, nothing to do. We just keep it in, in double precision. This is a block that is near the diagonal, but it's already low rank enough to be, to be stored as low rank. And as you can see, we just need to store the very first um, single pointer doesn't work. The very first single values in double precision. And then we can gradually switch them to, to lower precision. If I get far away enough from the diagonal, I will get very, very low rank blocks. And then um, what's noticeable here is that I don't actually have to store any singular vector in, in double precision. So that's actually quite striking. And I even have a very extreme case where all the block, all the singular vectors can be stored in, in B-float 16. That's because as I get away from the diagonal, the, the blocks get really, really low rank. And the final example that I like a lot is this one. So this block is actually not low rank enough. The decay of the singular values is, is very slow. So in, in the standard approach, I would not store this block as a low rank matrix because I, I need more than half of the singular vector. So it would require, require more storage under low rank form. But this is only 
in double precision. In adaptive precision, this is no longer true because I can actually switch most of those finger vectors to um, lower precision. So in fact, this requires less storage than storing the full block in double precision. That's quite interesting. So, um, so now the idea is we want to build a preconditioner out of this block low rank matrix. So the way we're going to do this is compute an LU factorization of it. I'm not going to go into the details of the algorithm, but it's basically just a block LU algorithm where we take advantage of the low rank form of the blocks. And we have an analysis of this, uh, which accomplishes two things. The first is it, it proves that this is a stable algorithm. We, we knew that it was stable in the double in the uniform precision case from, from a recent paper with, with Nick. But now, even using adaptive precision, that, that's still a stable algorithm. So that's a bit of theory. But perhaps more importantly, from a practical point of view, this analysis, we use it to determine which precision we need for we for each operation in the algorithm. So just taking an example, in the BLR LU factorization, I need to multiply low rank blocks by dense blocks at some point. And so in adaptive precision, these low rank blocks, they are partitioned into several precisions. So I can rewrite this product as, the, as two products, one with the double precision part and one with the single precision part. So the double precision part of the product, obviously is just two double precision objects. So it's no surprise that we need to do it in, in double precision. This part here, I have a single precision matrix that I need to multiply with a double precision. one. So here it's not obvious at all which of the two precisions I need to use. And that's where we need the analysis to tell us which of the two precisions is the, is the right one. The good news is that the, the right precision is the lowest. So that's going to be efficient. And so just a few, few results here on a, on a range of matrices that, that are amenable to block low rank compression. So this shows you the proportion of, entry, of flops, sorry, uh, in the LU factorization that needs to be performed in which precision. So yellow is before 16, green is um, single precision and blue is double precision. And here the target is 10 to the minus 12. So we are far above single precision and certainly before 16. And nevertheless, we can perform actually a decent amount of operations in, in lower precision. And the percentage on top of the bar is just an estimation of the cost. Just assume that the, the cost is proportional to the number of bits. And if I decrease my target, obviously I can switch more operations to lower precision, and therefore the, the gains are also uh, higher. Here, I'm showing an example where it's 10 to minus six. So as expected, I don't need double precision anymore. Nothing surprising. All right, so my take home message is a picture. Um, I think because of the evolution of the floating point landscape, we now have so many precisions that we can use that we need to rethink the way we design our algorithms. And I've given you two examples in two different frameworks, uh, applications where I think this has some potential. So thank you for your attention.